touch one hair of your head before he goes before my father and gets permission from my father. And before he gets permission from my father, he's had fellowship with me and he has a trust inside of me that he can send me through the valley of the shadow of death. Hallelujah. He can send me through the valley of the shadow of death. And as David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Well, growing up on a farm, We'd, we'd have brush fires, or uh, what would you call them? Bomb fires. And it was quite an enjoyable event, to be honest with you. And we would uh, take our brush out and fence rows or whatever it would do, and we'd, we'd, we'd get rid of it, set it on fire. And so we're building we're building Andrew's house. We've got a lot of scrap. It had been a drought throughout the summer. It was a bad drought in, 19, in, in 2007. And it was dry. Of course, we're living in the middle of woods and you can't just have a fire just any time. I gathered up a lot of stuff there. And I was, I was getting ready to, to burn and had to be extremely cautious about it. And we had the recycling center and we'd gather stuff there and why? I had a propane I had a propane tank and it was a five pound tank and had a torch on the end of it with about a twenty foot hose. And had a a clicker that would that would light it. And so we we had tried to burn a, a couple of days, but it would be too dry. Couldn't do it. And so I'd been away, I'd been away all, basically all day, and Brother Lloyd Walls and myself had been together. And uh, we'd been together at a, at a big auction. Came back home that evening, and, and I had a brother in my church, Brother Garland Atkins had passed away. And so we went to the viewing, and we did all the things that, that are involved with that. And, and I was on my way home, and, and Brother Timothy Pruitt had called me, and we were talking and just, just chit-chatting about life and on our way home, and we're going to get home, and it started raining. And I thought, boy, this would be a good night to have, some, have a fire and get rid of that, that trash, and I'll just go do that. And it was raining pretty good. So I go in the house, and I change clothes, and I've got a suit on, and and I go in and I, we're country boys, and I just put on a t-shirt and a pair of bib overhauls and a pair of work boots. And I take off out of the house and Whitney's sitting over on the bed and doing her homework. And, and she said, where are you going? I said, I'm going, I'm going to light that fire. I, don't you tell your mama, I'm going to light that fire. She, I, she don't like me doing that. Don't you tell your mama. And, so I took off out of the house and didn't tell nobody what I was going to do. And, and I was out there and Whitney needed graph paper for her homework project. And unbeknownst to me, she'd call Matthew. Matthew just was married and, and he'd been in college and he had graph paper. Just shows the Lord's providence in everything. Her need for graph paper my need for somebody to drag me out of a fire. And, and he saw the flashlight up, up about 100, 150 yards from the house. And, and he, he came up, actually drove his truck up and throwed the lights and it was raining and the windshield wipers were going. And he said, uh, Are, you know what you're doing? And I said, oh, I did this a hundred times. And so I can't get the propane to light. And unbeknownst to me, it was, it was just bowling out. It's a big five pound tank and like a barbecue tank and it's, 
it's coming out the end of that torch and I'm not paying any attention to it. And, and as it's coming out, I'm trying to get it lit and trying to get it lit. And finally, finally it lights. And when it lights, it was like a bomb that went off. Of course, I don't remember any of this because of the anesthesia wiped that away. But Matthew said it was, looked like it was 30 foot high. It looked like just walls of fire that was around us. And, and I fell due to the concussion of, of it going off. And, and when I fell, he said he just grabbed me. And he grabbed me with such force. Matthew being a very strong boy, grabbed me with such force it, it pulled his shoulder out of place. And he said he got me to my feet and we took off running. And I fell again. And he fell as well. And he burned his arms. He would be in the hospital four days and then have surgery on his arm, his shoulder, and get it all put back together. All of a sudden I heard this noise and I thought, that's odd. Not knowing, I was thinking Ron was in his office, had no idea that he was outside doing this fire deal. And all of a sudden I heard this noise and I thought, that's odd. Is that our dogs? And I could hear it getting closer to our house. And the next thing I know, Matthew's stumbling through the door and he's going, Mom, we've been burnt. And I said, burnt? I didn't even know Matthew had came at that time. I don't remember it, but they said there was just hideous screams that was going on. And Andrew was in there. And he, he had just got married back only a couple of months before that. Actually, that was the Lord's doing as well because he was due to get married the week after we was married, but something after we were burned, but but something made him move, and I know that was the Lord, made him move his marriage up into July. And so he was he was in the house and he came ran, running out. And instead of calling the rescue squad, he said, I'll just take you to the rescue center. So he took us to the rescue center there and and, and they there were people already stationed waiting. There was eight people that would jump into the rescue squad and begin to working, working on Matthew and on myself as well. My daughter-in-law Katie and Whitney um, drove me on out to the hospital following the squad and I saw them pull off the side of the road and I could see them in there working and that was traumatic to me. No one wonder what is going on because in my mind, I knew he was able to talk to me. I knew, he, I, I knew he was serious on his arms. The burns were so bad, but at that point, not knowing that it had affected his lungs because I had, didn't even get to talk to Matthew for three days from the accident to find out what had even happened. You know, and everybody was asking this and this and, and saying these things. Well, I didn't know. I couldn't tell them, you know, even I told the doctor, you know, I didn't even know what had happened. I just knew there had been a propane explosion. And my arms were burnt, my face was burnt, my, my neck was burned, my lips, my throat. What we would come to realize very quickly that the danger was my throat was swelling shut and my lungs were full. Uh, they would pull over a couple of times and, and the and the people that, actually I just spoke to the man that was driving the, the rescue unit. And he told me, he said, there's one thing about it, we never thought that we'd get you to the hospital alive. The guy that was the, actually the, the main fellow that was working on me in the, in the unit it was, is the mayor actually of our little town. And his mother believes this message. And they go to another little assembly and he recognized who he was working on. And so they had prayer in the rescue. But he's told me it took God to get us there because he was just trying to keep me alive until he could get me to the, to the, to the trauma center at the hospital. 
when they wheel me into the trauma center, they put me in a room called 14. And in four room 14, there's a doctor. I actually just got to meet him just a, just actually a couple months ago. And it was in a Charlottesville uh, airport. And I saw him and recognized him. And I began to talk to him. And he said, you're the fellow that was burned. So we talked for about an hour. And he told me, he said, I put hundreds of patients into a sedated coma. And he said, it, I didn't put you down. He said, the reason we put you down is because of you was burned so bad until we knew it put, put a shock on your body and you'd die from the shock. But also when I looked at your lungs, they were 75% burned and it was completely full of soot. They would take me to UVA and Connie would begin to mon monitor it and, and the calls were coming in. But they gave me the opportunity just before, just before putting me down. Um, my my father-in-law was in the room. And I think my brother-in-law was in the room. Connie wasn't in the room just yet. And she didn't get to me until after they'd already put me down. And, and when they did that, they asked me if I had any last words. My dad-in-law told me, he said, you told us you loved us. And that, and the doctor told me, he said, I thought that would be the last words that you'd ever say in your entire life. When we got to the hospital, um, they put me in a room where, and this is what was so traumatic to me at the time, they put me in a little room that I've always known that they tell you that your loved one has died. And I'm thinking, why are they doing this to me? So finally they came in and they said, I said, can I go see him? And they said, not right now, we're working with him. But you can go see your son, Matthew. So I went back and was able to visit with Matt and Cassie. And at that time, they come back and they told me that they were uh, going, was hoping to be able to airlift Ron to the University of Virginia uh, Burn Center. But with it raining, they could not do that. They had to take him by priority. And they told me that I could go back and see him. And, uh, but they had, to prepare me that they had sedated him and put him on a ventilator. And when I walked in that room, I wasn't prepared for what I saw. And one thing that sticks out in my mind, I still see this little young nurse, and she's crying. I'm thinking, what is she crying for? You know, is my husband this serious? But what later when I found out, she was so emotional because they had cut his wedding band off, and that had really affected her. You know, and I thought, you know, that really touched my heart to know that this girl was affected by his wedding band being cut off. While I was in the coma, I would come to just enough one time to know when they're scrubbing me, and that was just a very difficult time. I'd come to just enough to know they were scrubbing me and I didn't know what days that would be or whatever. But one other time that just absolutely stands out significant to me was I, I, I just became aware. Uh, the room was dark. I, I could hear myself breathing. Uh, Brother Lloyd Walls was in the room. Well, the Lloyd's a pastor at, in Richmond, a real, a real friend of mine. And he had came to visit me and it was, of course I didn't know it was nighttime. I, I believe it would be a Saturday night. And he came in to visit me and what I know now is it was a night to where that I had, I had VRE pneumonia and I had aspirated. And it was the time to where the doctors would give up on me, not believing I would live. Actually, they'd actually say that they had lost me on this night 
Brother Lloyd had came in and just felt led of the Lord to come and pray for me. And what I remember about that act, that evening was I became aware as I watched him. He walked around my bed, uh, particularly from my right to my left. He would walk and I would, I would watch him and, and he would walk around kind of like that. And he laid prayer cloths on me that night. It was a male nurse that was overseeing him that night, and so he came up to me and he says, they didn't call you during the night to tell you how he's doing? And I said, no, nobody's called me. He said, well, he's took a turn for the worse, and he's on the highest setting that the ventilator can be on. And uh, he said he aspirated, and he said he's very, very critical. And, you know, just hearing those words was, you know, I knew he was serious, but to hear it from him, I didn't, I think it maybe, it, it, it hit me then how serious Ron was. I, I looked out the glass enclosure, and I came in, I came alert enough, and I kind of evidently rolled my eyes to my right, and I saw Connie standing outside of the room. And, and she had her arms folded like this right here. And there was something within me. I wanted to tell her I loved her. And she just had that look. <clears throat> it was about, I don't know exactly the length of time just now, but they would do graphs on me. And I'd ask the doctor later in our consultations why that they waited so late to do the graft work. Because they had scrubbed me for over two weeks and my arms had been burnt, particularly on my left arm, had been burnt to the bone. It melted the skin and the meat away. And, and they'd, I asked them why did they had waited so long to do the graft work. And the doctor looked at me and he said, well, We've learned there's just no need in putting grafts on a dead man. And we really didn't expect you to live. I was waiting for a time that I would hear that he was feeling well and I would give him a call and, and uh, speak with him over the phone. Um, but that time never came. It, one day, turn into two and two into three and three into four and you know we're keeping hearing reports and I began to receive personal contact from Brother Barry Coffey who started sending me updates that were somewhat different from what they were on Karen Bridge. Um, Karen Bridge was uh, maintained by Brother Ron's uh, children that were kind of uh, keeping everybody updated that uh, on his condition. And so it was very positive. And Brother Ron had a good night and, you know, he's doing better today and this and that and the other. So I, I would constantly um, check that. And then I began to receive reports from Brother Barry Coffey that, you know, that things wasn't maybe as bright and cheerful as what we had heard and the situation was seemed to be more grave. I had uh, an invitation to come and preach for Brother uh, Craig Boer in Ohio. And I, several weeks before, I normally get a ticket to fly into a place to minister and I had for some reason not not done that. I just had put it off and put it off and until whether the ticket was had become astronomical. And uh, so I called a friend of mine who offered me a buddy pass where I could travel more um, at my leisure, you know, kind of choosing the times and of, of um, my departure. And uh, and so, as I was preaching that meeting, we were having prayer for Brother Ron at Brother Boers and 
trying to give updates to um, the local church there as to his condition. And, and um, I just began to have a, a real burden on my heart to, to go home. I must get back home where that I, I could tr would be free to travel and, and go to see Brother Ron. And in fact, um, I left from Brother Craig's, I walked out of the pulpit, got into a car and was taken immediately to the airport on Sunday afternoon and got the last seat in an aircraft to fly home to Shreveport. On Wednesday morning, I had a intense burden to, to go see Brother Ron, to find out what was going on and to also to, to have prayer with him. And this became a real uh, impulse, real burden, real driving force. And so I had the, the Wednesday night service to preach, being that I had been out of town the week before. I wanted to come back to church and minister before going again. And I was, went down to my barn and was doing some chores. My son Timothy, who ministers with me here at the church, came into the barn and, and I began to tell him of my burden and my need that I felt in my heart to go there and to see Brother Ron. And, and Timothy just spoke very emphatically and with inspiration, said, Dad, we can take care of everything here. You need to go and see about Brother Ron, and you need to go now. And I said, now? He said, yes, now. I said, well, what about the service tonight? He said, I, I can handle that. I'll just um, go to church and tell the people that you needed to go. And so within an hour, Karen and I was in the car, had packed up and left. And we drove um, for about 10 hours that day and stopped and got up and went again the next. When I walked into the room, of course, I had received a picture the day before I left, or the day that I left, from someone, uh, it was Mark Spencer, it was Brother Ron's brother, had sent me a picture of Brother Ron in the hospital. And I, you know, at, at that moment I began to realize this was very, very, very serious. And so um, I, uh, I, uh, was prepared then when I went into the hospital room to, as to what I would see. And uh, when I saw Brother Ron, of course, I, I saw him as it was like a flicker of recognition came across his eyes as, as I looked down upon him. And I began to immediately tell him, you're going to be all right. This is not what you think. Because um, I knew that possibly his thoughts were that I must be in a very bad situation for Brother Tim to come 14 to 16 hours drive to come and see me. So I did not want to alarm him. I wanted him to, uh, to be at peace about it. And I began to tell him, this is not what you think. You're going to be all right. And uh, began to tell him, you've been in an accident. And, um, but you're, you're going to be fine. And we're going to pray for you. And God's going to intervene. I remember uh, just being very, very groggy, waking up the first time. And Brother Tim was there to explain to me. Of all the people in the whole world, my buddy was there to explain to me of what had happened to me. Because of the sedation and being in the coma, it had wiped my memory, which still is some difficult things, but Brother Tim would explain of, of the fire and of the accident to me. That day was a particularly good day. I, 
I was able to sit up. They had made a special chair for me to sit in. And I was still on the, I was still on the ventilator, tubes down my mouth and seemed like a huge water hose that was down in there. And I was able to communicate pretty clearly with Sister Connie that day. My family was in the room and we had talked and they had talked to me and I of course couldn't talk to them. But I tried to communicate by batting my eyes and making some kind of motions. And, and I was just so happy Brother Tim had been there. And family had been in and a lot of visitors had been in. And the thing about I tried to communicate to them, of course I couldn't see myself. Well, I wanted to know if I'd lost my teeth. I just had crowns across my teeth and why well, I'd put a lot of money into that. And my dad had, was wrestling for a bill at a restaurant and, and I hit my own mouth and knocked my front tooth out. So I had to have my teeth replaced in the front. And I, so I, instead of just doing one, I, I did four or five there. And so <laughs> evidently my concern was I burned my face, I burned my arms, did I, did I lose my teeth? So they had communicated to me. Well, I couldn't communicate that to them. They couldn't figure out what I was trying to tell them. But later I would ask them. I would tell them, say, I was trying to get you guys to tell me had I lost my teeth or not. We were all in there and he was able to emotionally, you know, we were such emotional high because he was alert. He knew us. And he was trying to talk, even though he couldn't because of the ventilator. And he was, you know, doing so well, you know, and he kept on using his hands and like he had told before, using his hands to point up here. And we was trying to figure out we used, tried to do an alphabet, done writing, wrote letters on a piece of paper to try to get him to figure, us to figure out what he was trying to tell us. But he was concerned that he had spent all that money on his teeth and lost his teeth, but he hadn't. And he had done so good that day. When I walked into that hospital room, if I ever felt like a high priest, where a high priest would go in carrying the burdens of all the people before God, I felt as if that I was carrying all the prayers of all the saints from around the world and that I was representing them in that moment. And I felt that I was bringing those prayers before God and interceding on his behalf and begin to call on God to bring a resurrection and a miracle that would bring him up out of that condition. Well, the next morning, we went into the hospital room and they had set Brother Ron up in a special chair. And they had removed the breathing tube where he could talk. And he wasn't able to say much, but it was seemed to be a better condition than the day before. And we were, you know, I again began to talk to him and tell him why I was there and that he was going to be all right and that, you know, just began to speak words of faith to him and to talk to him of words of encouragement to try to get his faith to a level where he could just believe God with, out any questioning that he was going to totally recover from that. I knew something was going on. I really didn't know what it was. Later in the evening, she would go to the, she'd go to church. And, and the guys would come in and they'd begin to work with me that evening. And, the doctors came in, and I knew something was going on. 
And I became aware something, something's happening here. And I felt myself slipping away. I remember thinking, this must be what it's going to be like to die. I could hear my breaths. And they laid me down and they were working with me. And later to find out that it would come to a spot to where there wouldn't be any response or activity for over 36 hours. And we'd go through Saturday night we go through Sunday, and the doctors, the doctors would, would begin to give up hope. And then the next morning, um, when I called in and they told me that something had happened and they didn't know what was going on and that there was, they was concerned because of brain activity. And that particular Sunday, it was a very, very stressful because, and they had told me when I went in, they said it's going to be emotional highs and lows. There's going to be good days, bad days. But we were so excited about Saturday where he was able to talk and to go in the next day and to see, I mean, he was, you're just looking at him and he's just staring at you. I mean, there's no movement, nothing. I had not heard of the news of the night and when I got there, well, it was like they said. It was like um, the lights was on, but no one was at home. And it was just a stare and, and uh, no flicker of recognition. And so we just had prayer for him. And then I went back to make preparations to minister again on Sunday night. Unbeknownst to me, Brother Tim had came and he'd spent the weekend and preached for me. And today would I'd, I'd wake up. I would hear about five o'clock in the morning that there was decisions that were being made, what we're gonna do, or I'm gonna run CAT scans, or there's no response, there's seems to be no activity. Seems like the lights are on, but there's just nobody in there. Karen and I, during the hour's drive to the hospital, I stopped at a Cracker Barrel. And she and I joined hands together and we prayed. And I just said, Lord, you're a God of miracles. And I'd like to be able to speak with Brother Ron before that I leave. And I'd like him to know me. And I don't want to go and leave here with him in the condition he was yesterday. And I'm just asking you to come on the scene and make it where that I can visit with him and speak to him again and have some fellowship and prayer together before I leave. We got there that morning and we all four sat in the waiting room. It was forever, it seemed like for me to even go back there because they were telling me that they were going to run CT scans and other scans on him that they could not understand what was going on. Well, I think Katie or someone had put it out on the Karen Bridge, you know, that to go to prayer that he had, you know, it was serious, word got out. So, I mean, it was thousands of people praying at that time for him. And we were all sitting in the weight room and they told us that uh, finally came out and said we could go back. And I st still remember this. We're walking down the hallway and I hear this voice. I'm thinking, that's him. See, I hadn't heard him on Saturday or Sunday talk. And they've done told me that there is no brain activity going on. And I'm thinking, that's wrong. And I'm so excited I could run down that hallway. And when I walk in the room and Brother Tim and Sister Karen are with us and he didn't know me but I didn't care but he knew Brother Tim and that's my name I will always remember and he said oh my buddy Brother Tim 
And, you know, I just cried, cried, and cried. I thought, Lord, you're so good. I don't care if he don't know me. He'll know me. I come to it, it was, it was just, it was strange to me. I, I saw something that, that I, that I had talked, thought about all my life was to see a ball of fire, pillar of fire. Not only that, might sound unreasonable to some people, but I saw Brother Branham as a young man standing in the room. Brother Tim was there. His wife, Sister Connie, my parents were there. And I recognized my buddy. I think I told him, my buddy. <laughs> and I told them that Brother Branham had been there for quite a while. And I realized seeing, seeing Brother Tim, my wife, my family, not only them, but seeing Brother Branham, I realized I was in a precious state of life. I was hanging in the balance. I could go home to be with the Lord. My dad and my in-laws, you know, constantly would tell me, talk positive. Always, my dad said, you talk positive, don't talk nothing negative in this room. You talk positive about the Lord, you talk about Brother Branham to him. You let him have something that he can recognize, Connie, that in this room. And that's one thing, his ears were swelled so bad, but until I got an iPod holder, I just held me and Whitney would hold that iPod and put the earphones up to his ears because they couldn't even go in his ears. He was swelled so bad. But, you know, and when he made that statement, he said, Brother Bradham's been here and there's been a nurse that's worked on me and been in here every day. Well, I knew that they, were, they wouldn't allow the same nurse. And to, my, to this day, I don't know who he was referring to, but I know it was an angel. I know that God was in that room. One doctor sat down and shared with me one morning. And he told me, he said, we don't know patients when they come in to us. He said, but we know them by their visitors. And we saw your visitors and people that traveled a long distance to see you. He said, we kind of recognized there was something special here. He said, one night, he said, when I thought I was going to lose you, he said, I don't know what you believe. I don't even know if we know the same God. He said, but I got down on my knees beside your bed. And he said, I called out to God because I did all that I could do with my ability. And he said, I called out to God. And I asked, I asked God to spare your life. I came home and Sister Connie would begin to take care of me. It would take her two hours every morning to dress me. She'd give me medication to where I could stand the pain. She was an incredible nurse. It brought us together like never before. When I first came home, I, being laying like I had laid, there was some forgetting to learn to walk and that kind of thing. All my nerves trying to wake up in my arms and my face. Brother Harold Hildebrandt, we would come to learn that Brother Harold had came to see us. And it was the first weekend I was home. And he came to see us there and he preached for me that weekend. And he told me when he heard about the accident, he immediately he immediately called his deacons, called the men around him. 
He said in a burn case, there's a lot of times people are disfigured. But he felt burdened of God to have prayer for me that my face wouldn't scar. Well, you can see the pictures. It was pretty bad. Didn't make me any prettier, but it was pretty bad. Uh, Brother Harold would tell me, he said, Brother Ron, we prayed that there wouldn't be one scar left on your face. And just to show you the miracle of God, why? My face didn't scar at all. But about three months later, I was helping my father-in-law work on a barn. And I fell and fell against a nail and it scratched my, my jaw. Why it, never, why it never hardly bled, but it scarred, it scarred right there, you can see it. There I just had my face burnt all the way into the high part of my, my line, down my neck. And no scarring at all took place. And I simply had a fall and had a scar right across my face. I believe that was all to show the handiwork of the Lord, of what a great miracle that we had actually witnessed. I remember sitting in that wheelchair thinking, when I first got home, and I'd hear the enemy in my ears tell me, you'll, you'll never preach again. Your ministry's over with. But I remembered when I first woke up from the coma, Sister Whitney would tell me, I'd say, boo devil, boo devil, boo devil. Because I'd preached it. What Brother Branham said, that the devil couldn't touch a hair of your head until he first got permission from our Father. And God had confidence in you that you could go through that trial. I don't believe my accident was a it's because I did any sin, made any bad mistakes. Well, I felt like I was serving the Lord in all the best of my ability. But I felt like that I thank God that He would have confidence in me, that I could have this experience, that it would draw me closer to Him and and to find out how important and what the most important things are in life. Struggling with my lungs, it, I felt the extreme disappointment. Weary, tired, difficult to go through the day. I remember coming to youth camp. I remember what Timothy told me. Timothy told me, Brother Tim's son, told me, he said, it doesn't matter if all you can do is stand on that stage. Just to stand there one more time is to give a black eye to the devil. I feel like every day that I get up now, the enemy's defeated. I was sitting kind of in what they, it's kind of a theater type building. And I was sitting with Sister Connie Brother Homer and Sister Nancy, my father-in-law and mother-in-law. And we were sitting kind of in a balcony area, sitting beside a great big huge white pillar. And as we sat there, and I was listening to the message, because I've, I've, I've always believed that no matter where I'm at, when a man of God is speaking, God has laid something on his heart for me particularly, to get, to get out of that meeting. And so as I was listening to Brother Biscoe preach, he was talking about how that God took the chaos of this world when it was without form and void. And he brought it to a perfect Eden to where God could have fellowship with man. Then he began to talk about our new birth and a real justification, and a real sanctification, and a real baptism of the Holy Ghost. The last part of his service was that how the Satan will take this body, injure this body, and 
take bruised cells and cancer cells and how we'll get injured. And something quickened in my heart. This is my night. I'm sitting there and why well, my own doctors told me that I probably would be on oxygen. My lungs are burned worse than why well, worse than any smoker's lungs that had smoked smoked all of his life. Something I was gonna have to learn to live with. But I believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Hebrews 13 and 8. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And he took those stripes at Pilate's judgment hall that I could be healed. And I sit there and I realize that right now is my opportunity. I stood to my feet right there as Brother Biscoe was preaching. And I raised my hands before God. And it felt like a column of air came down over top of me. It felt like it was literally going to blow my lungs out of my chest. I'll tell you that very evening, God did a complete work in my life. He came down and gave me a brand new set of lungs. I fought infections after that. But He's our healer. He's my way maker. Seemably, I've never struggled in a pulpit to preach. Seemably, I have no trouble on a treadmill or walking up a set of stairs. But God 100% healed my lungs by the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can only imagine what it would have been like in John 12 for Lazarus to be sitting where Jesus was talking. He's just been resurrected. Why, only just a few moments ago, he's been with, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's hearing the echoes of the high priest talk about, talk about that they're going to put Jesus to death, and now they want to put him to death. What it must have been to be around him that he had a testimony. Why? We talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You've heard me say that God did me a favor. Many of our trials of our life, we wonder to ourselves, why are we going through this? Maybe even look back and question. But the enemy doesn't realize that these trials are more precious to us than gold. And the closer that those boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, got to the fire, the closer they were being driven into the presence of Almighty God. We could look back and maybe want to change a lot of the events. And why we had plans to go to Brother Tim Dodds and dedicate his services with Brother Biscoe there. We had plans to go on a hunting trip with Brother Kelly Hildebrandt and to bow hunt and to preach his annual meetings. We make plans. We think and we pray and we believe. But God's ultimately in control of our lives. Many times we walk in and sit down in a service and we think, well, this is just another service. And that service has been dedicated and maybe hundreds of people have been brought together that God wants to have a personal interview with you. He'll take the gift inside of a man and he will anoint that man to speak a certain way put a passion in his heart to take this word and to stand before a congregation maybe feeling he can't preach his way out of a paper bag but he'll know that that service is orchestrated whether there's five people or, or 10,000 people in the building and God will take him and through his body and the gift that he put in his life to take the scriptures take quotes stories, events, to speak to that individual's life. They may come to church for years, and then one day it hits, and they're never 
never the same the rest of their lives. And I believe that God has given us the opportunity. Brother Tim and myself are buddies. But he's given us an opportunity to be a part of a testimony that God, before the foundation of the world, saw fit to allow us to be a part of. And, and we believe with all of our hearts that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, no matter what kind of trial that we go through, that God is in control of it. And we also believe, and this furthers our, our assurance in our life, that the devil can't touch a hair of our head until he's went before our Father and asked permission that he could do it. And when we go through a trial, we've got confidence that God saw us, that he'll help us through it. And I believe it's been a favor for me with God to be able to, to be a part of such an experience. He can't touch one hair of your head before he goes before my father and gets permission from my father. And before he gets permission from my father, he's had fellowship with me and he has a trust inside of me that he can send me through the valley of the shadow of death. Hallelujah! He can send me through the valley of the shadow of death. And as David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And the book of remembrance shall be written of those, of those that fear the Lord, and thought upon His name, and thought upon His name. Sun of righteousness arise with him.